Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly at even a dollar a month or hit patreon.com slash Aksum. Today, our special guest is Alistair Thompson. Did I pronounce your name correctly? And welcome to the show. You did. And thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I listened to your podcast with Jeff Pierce and, and um, thought it was astonishingly good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, um, you know, I, I check a lot of the data and things like that. And I look through click through rates and, and things like that. So I always wonder, and this will be part of our, our questions and, and some of the discussion we're going to have when I, when I ask you what um, I started, I think the first hour or something exclusively on martial arts, which I think people who see uh, his name don't expect. I'm wondering uh, if you had any feedback on, on that or if you got bored and skipped it. No, I thought it was fantastic. It was enormously entertaining. <laughs> was, I, would, I would heartily recommend it. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Arts. This is a, definitely a very good subject. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, he, um, he knows his shit. <laughs> he really does. Uh, I don't know if you know this about me, but I've, I've uh, taken a couple seminars from him. And I've also, uh, not Jeff, but uh, the person I'm going to talk about, but the person I consider to be the greatest uh, jujitsu and mixed martial arts coach in the world is actually uh, both from New Zealand and America. I don't know if you know Professor John Danaher. Have you ever heard no, of him? No, I don't. I don't know. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. He's uh, he's the best. He's the best. Someone recently even gave him an uh, all, I, used, I played rugby in college. Uh, someone gave him an all blacks uh, jersey. And uh, it, it warmed my heart. But he's, in, in my opinion, the greatest uh, mixed martial arts coach. And I don't know if you, did you ever have any uh, martial arts background? Did you do any martial mm, arts growing no. up? I, oh, I, learned, I learned at school that I can't throw a punch and I can, <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I'm a natural pacifist. Oh, well, that's. Or something. <laughs> that, 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 there's a beauty in that as well. So then uh, could you introduce yourself for my audience in case yeah. they don't know you, but they should? Yeah. So um, I'm a journalist from New Zealand, um, currently living in France. I, I, um, I'm 53, I think. Yeah. And um, most of that life has been in New Zealand. I came to France when I was 47. I run a publication called scoop.co.nz, which is a is an inter early internet publication. The first iteration of it started in 1996, and then we relaunched in 1999. And um, for that entire period, basically, since 1996, I've been following foreign affairs issues fairly closely. Uh, and my introduction to to Ethiopia came as a result of, um, I had a job in Switzerland for two and a half years working in comms, um, which made me quite determined not to work in communications anymore. <laughs> um, and I mean, most of my most of my journalism experience in New Zealand was in politics as well. So, sort of um, in the in the press gallery, which is the the the, the press corps which are assigned to cover parliament. Um, and so, I mean, I've got a I've got a big background in foreign policy, sort of economics, and um, to some extent, um, yeah, uh, politics, economics, and more recently. Um, yeah, war, I suppose. Um, and yeah, so what what else? Um, that, no, that's great. Um, speaking of scoop, you're talking about it as both in the internet space and in the independent journalism space. Did you start off kind of going on your own like that in independent journalism? Or did you have to work at a more corporate entity in New Zealand before you got your own venture started? So I, I started in journalism when I was 19. So and Scoop was launched when I was 27. So I did a I did a fair bit of of conventional journalism, investigative mm -hmm. journalism, politics, arts, lots of feature writing, lots of stuff. Um, worked for a magazine, edited a rural newspaper um, for a while, a, nat a nationwide rural farming newspaper, and. Um, yeah, and I've basically been an editor since I was about 24, 25. And I mean, whilst I'm a reporter as well, I'm I'm probably more more an editor than a reporter, which is partly influences the way I see the world and the way I express myself. 
How would you differentiate the two for someone who's a total neophyte to the news? Well, editors are responsible for keeping control of reporters, I suppose. So yeah, I have to keep, I have to keep control of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and do you <laughs> do you just do you just gatekeep or edit for the sake of uh, you know grammar, or is there a certain voice that you look for in your publication? Uh, probably the latter, really. So I mean, we've we've um, we had in our early years, we sort of had a big history of publishing stuff, a lot of stuff from Americans actually, mm -hmm. um, about material which was difficult for them to to get placed in in the US. Um, so we had a quite a good relationship with Glenn Ford and the Black Agenda Report, and we published a lot of their stuff and early stuff from a lot of the other independent um, publications as well. So, I mean, global research in, in Canada and, I mean, there's a there's quite a strong um, thread of independent journalism in the United States as well, yes. which tends to also cover these sorts of fringe subjects and produces completely diametrically opposed narratives to American foreign policy. <laughs> yeah, I, I no, that's that's actually my favorite subject in the world. You know, like uh, U.S. critiquing. My political views have changed. Uh, people could say uh, a lot from their point of view, but I'll say one thing that has been consistent from middle school when uh, George Bush the uh, second, George W. was in charge uh, through Obama, Trump, all of them, Biden today. The, the most common thread for me has been a critique of that foreign policy and from people on the left and the right. Uh, Antiwar.com is something I always plug and, and something that I've always kind of uh, read about. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm, I'm really interested in this independence uh, streak that you're talking about, especially your connection to the Americans as well. Um, I've seen stuff like that, uh, usually coming out of Russia. I hadn't heard as much in, in New Zealand. And then people would, would critique that as, uh, people having sort of, sort of ulterior agenda, but that's, you know, that's why it's, there's a political agenda in the United States, which is why they don't get as, uh, uh, as, as much kind of prestige journals appreciation. But I'm, I'm wondering did you see because in america in journalism i hear from a lot of media critics that i that i respect that there's a sort of generational difference between the reporters and editors and it is the the kind of younger they are the more they kind of are into the the prestige journals which seems counterintuitive um but there are of course uh technologies like TikTok and twitter that have been sort of uh, democratizing or making more widespread independent journalism more feasible as well. D did you see a kind of generational shift? Like, was there a kind of Cronkite school when you started and then people kind of strayed from it? Or uh, was like, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what prompted you to, to make that independent move? Because you could have you could have stayed with the conventional media platforms, right? uh maybe um i mean i was i was publishing my own platform i mean i i i was and i and i was swimming in it so i mean i mean in the early days there was the howards and noam chomsky michael parenti sort of stuff and there's a lot of people from the same era but i mean journalism i mean i think one of the things people don't understand about journalism is that prior to the 1990s journalism was reasonably wealthy and powerful once the internet came along everything basically started slipping and and has has been declining from a from a monetary perspective ever since and as a result of that mm -hmm. a lot of the older journalists nearly all the older journalists have actually been laid off because a lot of them would have had pension plans and they would have had retirement schemes and so a lot of a lot of publications basically laid off in tranches journalists senior journalists continuously from the 1990s through till now. Wow. So, I mean, there's been an enormous erosion of the capacity and the, I don't know, the quality and the range and the variety of journalism in this. In, I mean, little, little newspapers used to be quite profitable because advertising was the only, was the only means. And newspapers also had classified advertising, which was effectively what eBay and Craigslist and, um, I mean, they basically got rid of classified advertising. So yeah. classified advertising was the main 
I remember in 2002, I went to New York and the Saturday edition of the New York Times back then was like two inches thick because it had so much classified advertising in it. <laughs> I mean, and that's, that's well after the internet's been underway for quite a while. The internet took quite a long time to get warmed up. That's right. Um, there were a lot of non-believers in the beginning. I often like to shout out the uh, entrepreneur who helped me a lot in my own work, Gary Vaynerchuk, and he talks about how he was very early, I think, on YouTube in 2006, starting to do wine videos. And as soon as email campaigns came out, he was one of the first email kind of uh, gatherers. And the other kind of uh, liquor store owners in that New York area were making fun of him. But ultimately, uh, he's been having that last laugh for a, a couple uh, decades now. And on this subject of you know, funding and the decline of all of these organizations, one of the kind of last ditch efforts that we have seen, uh, BuzzFeed, uh, not to beat up on them too much, is kind of the epitome of this. But there are a lot of places, even on YouTube, and I found myself even leaning into something like that for a little bit until I found it out and I, I, I ran away, is uh, kind of clickbait titles. Could you talk about what kind of uh, clickbait is in case anyone doesn't know it and why Scoop is in the public interest rather than than clickbait? Because the clickbait, I, I assume, it would get you more money. Well, I mean, headlines headlines are always um, going to be a little bit clickbaity because you sort of want them to attract people's attention. So, so um, you definitely try to make them interesting. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of um, it's not so much the clickbaity thing that is the problem. And clickbaity is 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 an issue, I think. For well, it is an issue in journalism, but it's. Um, and I mean, particularly in political commentary, yes, journalism, because people people will click on stuff which reinforces their opinion. So you end up creating these silos of of people that basically read similar stuff, and then I mean, eventually, I mean, under Trump, we saw this expansion of these right wing publications, which which provide. That's my cat mewing in the background. Um, Tui, be quiet. <laughs> um, they're please. jealous we're stealing your time <laughs> yeah so um yeah the um so, so on that, clickbait that, in this for example um joe rogan one of the highest grossing you know podcasters who you know any podcaster or really i think any media entity who's serious about their work needs to at least study uh has argued i think effectively that part of it is especially on the media the, the kind of limited time that they have and then they want to have like 30 people on and each person speaks for 30 seconds versus the sort of one-on-one -on -one long form conversation that that i like in in my uh channel for example do you have anything to say on the kind of the format or the structure that pushes them into that like long firm versus short firm and and having like you know a 10 person panel versus one-on-one -on -one conversations Look, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, lo the long film journalism is obviously coming back now. I mean, podcasts are enormously popular. These sorts of shows, like your one, are enormously popular. People like Joe Rogan as well, for the for the same reason, because it's sort of languid and and covers lots of ground and and so forth. I don't, I don't really listen to him, so I've got no idea what he actually does. So I haven't actually listened to him, to be honest. But I mean, he's he's obviously the he's the poster child of the most profitable. <laughs> <laughs> or the yeah. most highly paid, highly highly paid commentator on the planet. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't. I mean, there's a lot more than just clickbait that's the problem at the moment. There's just mm -hmm. shallowness. We yeah. have, like, I mean, especially when it comes to Ethiopia, the you have. I mean, back in the day, the Associated Press and Reuters and AFP were enormous organisations with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of correspondents now they have very few and they have some local staff and they have like two or three europeans covering i don't know all of africa sort of <laughs> basically, which is sort of it's just ridiculous and i mean previously there would have been there would have been ap reporters basically covering most of the wars and probably in the field and and um there would have been stringers that would already, already would also have been doing it all of whom would have been paid reasonably well um, the amounts of money that people used to get paid as freelancers were 50 cents a word when I was, I don't know, in, when I first joined journalism in the late 80s. Um, they're still 50 cents a word now. I mean, 
40 years later. That's tough. Yeah. <laughs> Inflation I mean, itself it, would eat that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's no money in it. So, I mean, to, to some extent, people who are doing journalism now are doing it for other motivations a lot of, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people make a lot of money. So like um, Alex Jones, for example, I mean, Alex Jones started out with, with a, he wasn't, he wasn't as dreadful as he, as he became. Um, he became more and more dreadful over time. And there's, that's true of a lot of media phenomena recently, that, that the stuff that was crap gets more and more crap and that you end yeah. up with billions of websites that are just listicles and you have a whole lot of, the world is just swamped with, I mean, the internet and, and Twitter is swamped with, with rubbish, basically. Yeah, I first came across Alex Jones in 2000 when I was in fifth grade and he was covering the kind of Seattle uh, uh, anti-globalization movements and then even in like 2004 he was critiquing the foreign policy of george bush so you're right like it, people have definitely changed all all over the place so you you mentioned a good point in these major uh, publications like the ap washington post new york times and the economist so how and and when did you know that um I mean, the, the least way I could say it is that they're not telling the whole truth about Ethiopia, but this sort of uh, extreme bias towards uh, the TPLF, and you could excuse me if you distinguish, but some people like to distinguish between the TPLF and then the the larger party that they established. In in my opinion, it was a, it was a dummy corporation, so you can use whichever language you prefer, but the sort of kind of one-sidedness of these organizations for a regime that kind of fell out of power in, in 2018, but was really strongly in power 91 to 2018. How, how did you know they weren't telling the whole truth about them? Well, I mean, I wasn't following Ethiopia in that earlier period, but I mean, what I, what I would notice is that, is that, I mean, there's that great video of, of um, Susan Rice, where she laughs on the podium in the, in the, in the state department about the 2006 election, I think, or maybe 2000, might have been a later one, but I mean, maybe, but there was, it was one of those early elections and she says, well, it was fully democratic and then breaks into laughter. I mean, it, I mean, the, I arrived on, on taking notice, I suppose, after, after, after January the 6th. I mean, I was, I was completely fixated like the rest of the world on the Trump meltdown, which was taking place in that early part of 2021. And um, I mean, after the, I mean, I took, I was enormously relieved when, when Biden was inaugurated and nothing happened, um, <laughs> celebrated that and then, and then started to look at up for other things to be interested in. And I was looking particularly at climate change because that's what I'm sort of reporting on now. I've been to the last two, two cops and um, I could sort of see the rest of my life being probably dominated by climate change because I expect all of politics and all of international relations is going to be dominated by politics probably for the next 50 years. Um, but I basically started looking for positive feedback loops because I was thinking, well, okay, climate change, bad, but I mean, maybe there'll be some good things. <laughs> and started, and particularly started looking to see if there was, maybe there was going to be more rain in the desert because Lake Chad used to be the biggest lake in the world. and. Um, and there's very there's very very interesting large aquifers under the under under the, the the Sahara, which are still full of water. I mean, there's quite a lot of water does fall on fall on the Sahara. And then I mean, the, there was the the Libyan. <coughs> one of the first things that happened in the Libyan debacle was that NATO bombed um, the great underwater underground river that that um, had been built by Gaddafi, um, which mm. is just criminal. Absolutely, like, absolutely criminal, appalling. And, and and incomprehensible that anyone would have thought to do that. I mean, why would they? Why would they do that? And I'm um, still haunted by the the images of his desecrated body that they were dragging through the streets, and I think they were putting on C-SPAN. I was actually in Congress. I don't know if you remember or ever knew about Dennis Kucinich, but uh, he was a congressman from Ohio, and uh, he cared about climate and foreign policy as well. And I was his legislative intern, and uh, I remember I remember that that time graphically. That's extreme. That's what extremely cool. I mean, I, yeah. I do know him, and yeah, that's very cool that you were his, his um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, he's like Paul Wellstone or something. There's a few other, other, other good, good, 
Oxford congressional representatives that thought for themselves. Um, yeah. Um, so the debacle in, in Libya, you were saying, is that the, the US foreign policy actually was destroying the climate in the area. Well, no, they would. They destroyed. They destroyed this irrigation scheme that would have basically made made Libya green on the coast. I mean, it was a, an enormous aquifer-driven um, irrigation scheme that was was going to to make the desert desert green. But I mean, I was I, what what I was doing is I was just looking to see well, maybe there's going to be more rain because I mean, if the atmosphere warms up, carries more water, it might be more rain. And I mean, and there was um, and. And the, the historical record, um, when you go back to the younger Dryas and the and the older Dryas, which are these periods where the temperature was higher because of either volcanic activity or possibly it was it's called the last glacial maxima as well. So there's a cold period in, in, in the in the climate in the climate record reasonably recently, um, where sea levels were higher, but also temperatures were higher for quite a while. And um and there's a theory that the reason, well, I mean, there's evidence that the Middle East was also green, that wow. there was trees and that there was animals in the Middle East, and 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 also Egypt more so as well. And so I was wondering whether that that was going to happen. And then, after finding a little bit of rain in in the middle of the desert in Algeria, I then I then sort of turned my attention to have a look at what was going on in Ethiopia and. Um, Discovered the dam, the Gerd Dam. Interesting. Um, initially, my father was a hydrologist, so he was a dam uh -huh. designer, and so I was, I was, I was always interested in in hydroelectric programs. And I mean, the dam is extraordinary. I mean, it's the Absolutely. it's the largest it's the largest it's the largest um, green electricity project in the world. And I mean, you 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 add other hydroelectricity and solar and wind capacity to that and you have you have an economic engine which will will transform all of east africa absolutely and, and, and to the chagrin of a lot of people it's attributable to three very different regimes it's attributable to emperor Haile Selassie. it's attributable to prime minister Madlis, and it is attributable to prime minister avi each of which had their their contributions to that project yeah 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 that's true um but um then then i sort of i mean i hadn't really paid much attention to the tigray war although i had known that there was a war um mm -hmm. i'd seen pictures of the tanks and so forth and then i s just run smack into this narrative about um about sexual violence which was yes. basically continuous i mean every publication was publishing these these portraits of these women that were that were that had been raped and their their witness testimony and I mean Financial Times I mean it was literally everybody was doing it, um, and um, and the Axum massacre and and I was horrified and then I and then I sort of looked a little bit more deeper because I, I was thinking well this is this seems awful and horrible and um, and then started looking well, what what was the US doing. <laughs> that's, a yeah, that's a good premise. Yeah, it's a good premise. And discover that that Jared Kushner um, and was was deeply involved in the uh, the whole Abraham Accords activity that took place was was to do with Egypt and Sudan in particular. But it appeared that that a lot of it was about leveraging Egypt to to help um, solve the solve the well basically solve the isolation of israel um mm -hmm. and and then there was also mnuchin so mnuchin was the chair or the or the coordinator of the negotiations about the GERD in 20 at the end of 2019 and they then came out of those negotiations and they tried to force um Abi to accept water debt so basically, in the event of a drought, if Egypt didn't get enough water, then Ethiopia was going to owe them that water. And I mean, that was that's essentially where the negotiations above the good sort of broke down because it's, it's a it's insane. a complete yeah. it's an utterly insane idea. And and um and I mean, and Mnuchin was pushing it. I mean, and then how is Mnuchin qualified to to run negotiations about about that? I mean. That should have been under State Department supervision. That shouldn't. It, that shouldn't have been under the supervision of of um of the Secretary of the Treasury. 
So um, yeah. that seemed that like aside by Trump that where he threatened to bomb the dam as well. Well, that was at the end. So I mean, I'm just going to get to yeah. that. So, so then, then the next thing that happens is that there's is that Abi delays the election, and he's immediately slapped with sanctions. Um, and I mean, that was also illegitimate because I mean, everybody was delaying their elections because of COVID. Um, but those sanctions, the reporting of those sanctions was pretty widespread, and 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 um, started to be critical of Abi. I mean, this is all the run in the run up to the to the to the to the Tigray war. And um, and there's the Abraham Accords, and Jared Kushner was basically d dispatched twice, and mm -hmm. eventually he 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 manages to get Sudan um, to 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 agree to also normalise its relationships with Israel under the Abraham Accords, and I mean I think the Abraham Accords are probably the best thing that Trump did. <laughs> But, but at the same time, it seems to have been paid for in Ethiopian blood, and that's what I—that's what—that's the conclusion that I came to at the time, because basically, on then on the twenty-third of of um, October, he um, well, I think, it, yeah, it was twenty-third of October, he he holds this holds this press conference with with Hamdok and um, Netanyahu on the phone, um, and. And a whole bunch of other people in his office, and he says that Egypt should bomb the dam. And this is like I don't know, eleven days before the election, which is also eleven days before the start of the war. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the timing of the starting of the war is something that people don't point to. The timing of the launch of the Tigray genocide narrative is something that people point to all the time. But I mean, the timing of the war was very, very, very deliberately. In, intended to to mean that no one would take any notice of it, no one would notice it. And I mean the the timing. I mean we've seen we've seen that since then. I mean we've seen other occasions when TPLF essentially chooses to 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 do things at times when they know that there's no, there's not going to be a lot of attention. I mean the invasion of of Amhara took place during the Olympics, mm -hmm. and there was no. I mean there was. I mean the 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 declaration of the of the Olympic truce took place, but I mean nobody took nobody nobody drew that to anyone's attention that there's there's a war that started at at exactly this moment as well. Um, they also started Operation Alula on June the thirteenth. They invaded Alamata. They took Alamata on the on the first day of of Operation um, of, of Operation Alula on June the thirteenth, and and um, yeah, and I mean, and that was also under that was under that was during the period of the lead up to the election on the twenty first of of June. So they they have a they have a habit of, I mean, the TPLF are nothing if not predictable. Whenever they whenever they invade anywhere, at all, it seems they they tend to go in, they steal things, they take money, they 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 and they assault people, um, and they kill people. And that's that's what the old timers from Walkite told me was happening to them in the in the late eighties, and it's still exactly what I was told in Cobo Robert when I visited Alamata recently. I mean, it's it <laughs> really stunning. Truly, I, I I you know I want to go back to what you said in the beginning. It's interesting you self-identified as a pacifist, but. Um, you'll have to appreciate this praise from me and, uh, you know, not let it get to you too much, but you're incredibly brave and courageous for having gone to these war zones, these active war zones. It's one thing to begin being a sort of passive observer of these events, but what prompted you to actually, you know, visit these areas? And could you talk about those interviews that are, uh, criminally underwatched, so we're going to plug your channel too, so that people could watch some of these interviews that you gave in Amharic and English. Um, so I didn't feel that I could legitimately write about Ethiopia without going there. I mean, all of the stuff that I'd done had been basically on Twitter and mm -hmm. um, talking to people on the phone as a result of meeting them on Twitter and, and I mean, to some extent, embedding myself a little bit in the, in the digital war. Um, as a commentator 
and an observer of of what was happening from probably about April through to well, actually, I mean, I didn't I didn't actually go to go to Ethiopia till twenty twenty two. So, mm-hmm. um, so for, for for a lengthy period of time. So the end of end of the war, and then it was the was the following year, and. Um, I mean, I chose to, I chose to go myself. I paid for my own trip. Um, it was quite difficult getting my press credentials on arrival. <laughs> well, I actually got them quite quickly, but then the immigration department yanked them and and I had to try and get them back, and that was a bit of a drama. Um, but um, but you were able to get it because that's another thing that Jamal Countess and others have talked about is. Uh, you know, is it the case that journalists can get in or is it not? There seem to be varied reports. Uh, well, I think I was, I mean, it was quite strange. I arrived when Tom Gardner was just about to be kicked out. And I think he was sort of the last one. He was the last last of the <laughs> last of the Western journalists who was still there. And when and when he left at, at that point, it was just me and Anne Garrison were left. And and I mean, Jamal's now become sort of kind of persona non grata because they think that that he's he's too closely associated with the Amhara um, cause, um, which I just think is sort of I don't know, it's ignorant of his professional um, integrity. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean, I would I would strongly suggest that they let him back. Um, but I mean, it's a it's a difficult situation, and and frankly, I can sort of understand why they booted all the journalists out because they were just shit. They were completely shit. I mean, Declan Walsh was appalling. Simon Marks was appalling. I mean, they, they were just, they were all terrible. I mean, the, and Tom Gardner, I mean, technically writing a letter criticizing, I don't know whether it's that's really a, an offense that he should have been kicked out, out for, but um, I mean, up to that point, he he tried to do journalism, but he he hadn't told the actual story. And the actual story was always obvious to me. There was no, there's never any doubt. I mean, I don't know how anyone could have sat through the war in 2021 and not realized that the TPLF was entirely responsible for everything. It's it's the narrative of all those major conventional organizations that you said to, I think, have the temerity that it takes to take a stand that is uh, contradictory to that. Um, is very rare it's few and far between not everyone crosses that threshold i was a social scientist by training in my undergraduate days and there was this famous social science study you may have heard of where they intentionally had a camera in an elevator and they had people facing the opposite direction of the uh the entrance exit and they would see if when you have two or three or four people facing the opposite direction even though you see visibly right there the door would you continue to face that door or would you turn around? And they found that the majority of people would turn around. And then they had this, this gig where right when the elevator opened up, simultaneously the people would face the right way and walk out. So people would know, you know they're on candid camera or something like that. But I think there must be something inside of you that is different than, than most people because I think it, it's just to cross the threshold to say all of those major organizations are wrong is a very hard place to get to and you better be very sure of what it is that you're talking about if you're going to do that now some of the the reportage that you did was on a place that's very close to my heart uh my my grandfather my maternal grandfather uh uh passed away in uh, 95 he was uh first buried in addis ababa but because of some issues there we moved him to his ancestral home of waldpa where many of his ancestors are buried at the monasteries there. And um, I appreciate that you use the term Walkait. Historically, from west to east, uh, for simplicity, people say Walkait, but from west to east, it's more fully Kafta Humara, Walkait, Tagade, and Talamt. That area is especially Talamt, Salamti, and the Tigrinya speakers. I don't make a big deal of the kind of sound differences that that people make because it's a it's a very silly uh, shibboleth. But could you talk about the kind of reports that you heard from from Waldepa? And I, I just thank you for not saying Western Tigray because I've had to fight so many people on that on Twitter. It drives me crazy. Yeah. Um, so I mean, when I when I first well, I mean, the, so 
leading up to my trip was watching Sheba and and um, and Jamal go to Gehenib. So they went to Gehenib and they reported on it. And I mean, that was also one of the reasons that I chose to go then, because I felt as though the the events the events in the Gondar study are, are spectacularly important, and the work that had been done by the Dondar researchers is something that was was extremely important to to follow up on. And I initially thought, well, I mean, I think the government should should go out of its way to try to get journalists to come there and be briefed and to understand what the evidence is that they've uncovered, because it's a lot. It's a lot more than just mass graves, and um, and in fact, yeah. the mass grave again is, is and, and others places, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, they surveyed hundreds of people, and they've all told them stories. I mean, they've they've got they've got hundreds of witness testimonies of 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 people's experience under under Wellcate's occupation, Wellcate's occupation. And then, um, so we went we went up we we drove north and we we got to uh, um, Adi Remitz, um, which was sort of militarized at the time. And and then from there we went we went on to on to Gehenna, um, and we spoke to lots of people along the ways and in, way, including sort of um, Kafang fighters, and and they told us stories. Um, but in Adi Remitz, we stayed in a little wee sort of um, traditional sort of boarding house, and there was lots of people watching television avidly with, as we as we arrived, and then we 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 sort of went to bed. And in the morning, I got up. Um, and I saw I saw that there were some monks there. And in the morning, one of the monks introduced himself to me, and and I and we t- I took a selfie with him, and and then he told me the story about what had recently been ha- happening in Weldebar, and he told me about people. I mean, he said, look, just the last last few days, people have had their arms and legs chopped off um, in Weldebar. Um, and then, anyway, so I was I was I recorded an interview with him then, and um, I then went. Um, to May Maygaba, I think it is, um, which is on the way to Gehenna, um, and is sort of very close to that Talib border and and near near Waldaba. And there we picked up a, a security guy um, who was, I think, military security, because that whole area was sort of under under very very strong military occupation to defend against an attack from Tigrilib. And he he confirmed the stories about what what were happening in Waldebar. Um and he talked about there being something called Betty Tama, which is some kind of I don't know perversion of 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 Christianity, which um, which was going on, and that and that they tried to introduce their own monks to come to Waldebar, and the, and the monks in Waldebar basically said no, and then after the monks had said no, they then started killing them and and mutilating them and. And various other awful things. So was this a religious uh, based uh, kind of dismembering or there was no ethnic component to it? I don't know. I mean, they just seem to, they just seem to be torturing and murdering mm-hmm. the monks. Um, and, and the monks were quite stubborn about staying there. Um, yeah. And then, and then later, later um, when I went back to Gonda um, towards the end of May, um, I I ran into them again, the same some of the same monks and and some more and spoke to them a lot more and got got much longer interviews with them and they told me the story of essentially Melles and his wife wanted to build a big sugar plantation and a big sugar plantation there on the sort of like the flat land beside the Takizi River and they yes. wanted to build a big dam and um and the monks had basically stopped the dam from being built for a very long time. Um, and and they've done so very skillfully, it sounds like, in, in legal terms and and in, in lobbying terms. Um, and and at that point, everyone had left except some of the very old timers who decided not to leave. And um, I gave them some money for to, for for a bus to get to find their way to another monastery where they were going into refuge. But I mean, the, they just yeah, I mean yeah, it was a. It was a very deeply moving encounters, all of the encounters I had with those monks. And I mean, this this is a this being in monastery, which is, I don't know, somewhere between the sort of fifth, fourth, and fifth centuries AD. I mean, it's it's astonishing. It's incredible. Established it, it by, is, by God Himself. I mean, it's just yeah. How can you desecrate? No, it's, 
it, it shows a sort of uh, deep-seated uh, anti-religiosity that I'll get back to and, and ask you about your faith at the uh, at the tail end there. Uh, but I really appreciate that you you um, did reports on on that side. On the other side, I don't have family, but I'm curious of, and because I don't hear as as much, especially about the Afar front. But I know you had some interview with people that were in the Battle of uh, Abala as well, and then in the Alamata area, which is near the border of Wallo and Tigray. Yeah. So on the Afar side, I went. I went there after. Um, I went there before. Actually, I went there before I went back to back to Gonda with Anne Garrison. And um, what we found there was a sort of like a an aid an aid thing which was in disarray. So there was a lot of I mean there's, that's where all the aid was being trucked through. And I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of 2022, well at the end of 2021. So on December the 21st, the war came to an end. The NDF celebrated the victory, and they did not chase the the TPLF back into into Michele. and um, and I think they, the reason that they didn't pursue them was because probably of American pressure. I mean, the Americans had had introduced um, Menendez had introduced S three one nine nine, the the sanctions bill. I think in late November, and I mean it was quite clear that the Americans were desperate to I don't know overturn Abe's government and had failed. And CNN was kind of miffed about the fact that they kept saying that um, I had a suburb surrounded and. I don't know, for, for several weeks the, the embassy was trying to evacuate everybody, every American from the United from, from Ethiopia. I mean I don't know. I mean the whole the whole thing was just unbelievable and and, and also unreported. Um, but around the same time as the war ended, a new war started in Afar. They invaded, fully invaded. They invaded Abala. Everybody fled. There was a whole lot of there was a whole lot of bullshit stories that were told about about um, Tigrayans and in, in Abala being being murdered because um, they had they had like attacked the defenders from behind and that there was then reprisals. I mean, Lucy Castle wrote several stories about this, which is just was just completely tr untrue. I mean, like I spoke to the one of the one of the people I went. Well, the person who took me up there was the was one of the de was I think deputy mayor or something like that of of Abala district or deputy administrator. Or well, maybe he was the administrator of the Bala district. I'm not sure. Mohammed Musa, um, but the um, yeah, and he was there when 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 they left. And I mean, his story, along with everybody else's story, is that everybody left the moment that they attacked, and that was in at late at the latest, sort of like early January. So everybody left, and then TPLF basically tried to come south down the down the the aid route. To to take um, to take the salt the salt mines and to take the the the, the Denkali depression, yeah. And um, I can't remember what the name of the town is briefly there, but it begins with A. And um, Aftera, and I mean there's a there's a there's a refugee camp there as well, and they were basically stopped by the Afar, and at a cost of thousands of Afar lives. Yeah. Um, incredible battle, and nobody knew anything about it. It wasn't mentioned by the government. It wasn't mentioned by the international community. Throughout that period, Dr. Tedros was using his COVID briefings to to claim that Tigray was under siege, that no aid yeah. was getting in there. But the reason that no aid was getting in there was because they were invading down the road to Aftera. I mean, it was completely closed because of their military activities. And nobody in the UN mentioned it. No one in the US mentioned it. I mean, how were you, how... Were you shocked that no one internally in the WHO or the WHO would kind of mention that conflict of interest between his kind of very global role and and the comments that he would make repeatedly? Well, I mean, at the time, I was I was routinely sort of I don't know documenting Tedros's abuses of power um, on Twitter and and. Yeah, I was. I mean, I'm I'm shocked still. I I can't. It's inconceivable to me that he's still in office. I mean, how can somebody who's quite clearly been involved in a war, which now even Borrell is saying has killed six hundred thousand people or a million people, 
I mean, Borrell is apparently a good friend of Dr. Tedros. So this is this is Joseph Borrell, who's the who's the high representative of the European Union. Um, so he's the chief diplomat. But I mean, he's basically a racist sort of Spanish former 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 sort of like um Franco cadre, as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just it's it's crazy. It's and I mean the the lack of attention on this conflict. I mean, these publications did terrible coverage, but they also sent terrible journalists, and and they never really cared. I mean, it, the only times that 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 they've ever done anything. I mean, Nima El her 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 content was probably the most high profile content that mm -hmm. was ever, ever published on this war. All of it is complete garbage. I mean, yeah. I don't I don't know how how um. Yeah, I mean. And and she kept doing it. I mean, like she she because she had more it. credence. People thought she had more ethos as an East African, right? Even though, yeah, it 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 was very disheartening. And uh, I think she complained about a lot of the digital war. Uh, you know, those uh, chickens coming home to roost, to use Malcolm X's uh, language. To to bring it to the current situation, you were talking about the timing of the TPLF. Uh, the kind of the election resistance, the initial strike of the Northern Command that kind of began these things and waiting for the Olympics, things like that. Other commentators have talked about the timing of the current situation where we are today in the midst of the three-day proclaimed Nineveh fast of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and communion with the entire Oriental Orthodox communion, but focusing specifically on the score or two folks who have been killed in Shashamani and elsewhere by by regional government forces, uh, uh, beknownst or unbeknownst to the, the federal government. Um, you had a fantastic thread on it. Uh, you said Abi Ahmed Ali's dilemma. Could you either uh, read your thread for us or, or summarize the, the thread that your thoughts on the current issue? I found it very, very uh, helpful and strayed very little from it. Um, well, I mean, I think that would be, I mean, reading the thread might be quite a good way of summarizing the um, summarizing the situation, introducing it to people who may not be familiar with what's just happened. So um, while I find it, why don't you give us a brief introduction to, to this, this saga? Yes. So, I mean, cause it, cause, and you, you could probably go back a little bit further because I, it, I arrived late. I was away for two weeks, so I went away on a, on a trip to visit um belgium and germany and, and switzerland to do some work and so I, I i missed all of the all of the lead up to it and um and then arrived and basically um said some stupid things which got me into a bit of trouble on twitter um and um but then then but then got up to speed and i mean it's a very very shocking situation which i regard as as a as a very, I mean, the, the threat that is the threat that is existing here in relation to this is of a continued violence in Oromia, continued attacks on churches, that sparking additional retaliatory violence and protection of the churches, etc. Um, but the other the other threat that's posed by this is the is the potential for it to actually resolve in the removal of Abi, which would also be catastrophic for for Ethiopia. I mean, whilst there's an awful lot of people that want Abi to go because they don't like him, um, you create a power vacuum and you no longer have have a leader, um, and in this case, a leader who who successfully defeated the TPLF and has consequently got a lot of political capital and um, presumably a lot of experience um, in dealing with complicated conflict-related matters. But you remove him, and then you there will be a power struggle. I mean, chaos chaos loves a vacuum. That's right. Yeah. As you're bringing it up and I threw it for you in the chat so you could uh, find it quicker. But I always go back structurally to the kind of constitutional reforms that the TPLF did in the early 90s, where always Ethiopia was known as the Ethiopian Empire or an Ethiopian nation state. And they said Ethiopia, rather than being a nation state, and this is where they prepared its balkanization, is a nation. Beher beherasab. This, this phrase that is so demonic that people use all the time. It is a nation of nations. And so they take the kind of 
uh, federalist framework of somewhere like the cantons of Switzerland or the states of the United States or the provinces of Canada, but instead of being kind of uh, neutral cantons, provinces, or states and regions where anyone could go anywhere, they say that each canton or province or state is itself a country. And so the kind of uh, logic behind that, and there's an article in the constitution that it kind of uh, encourages or allows for secession and thus balkanization if everyone seceded and you, you get a patchwork of like Ethiopia turning into 50 different countries is that each kind of area is its own distinct ethnic peoples. I would say honestly, uh, ethnically, as, as at least as I define ethnicity, I don't think it's the case that there's something like 80 ethnicities in Ethiopia. I think if you pushed it to its core, there, there may be four major ethnic groups. And if you, uh, you know, if you were, um, you know, less discriminatory, you could say maybe even three, uh, to be honest, the way I see it. But structurally from that time period, there are three different kind of situations and points of view that people look at the prime minister as. There's, there's one view where they say this whole time he's been a deep undercover TPLF guy. And some people have posted some of the recent pictures of him meeting with Getacho Radda, the kind of propaganda piece for the TPLF and other people and saying, what kind of backdoor deals did they do between uh, President Biden and the heads of TPLF, including Dabrazion and Getacho Radda? There's another point of view where people think that he's an Oromo secessionist. And this has been even some of my close friends who from the beginning was trying to take the capital city along with huge chunks of uh, central, western, and southern Ethiopia. There's another view, uh, an accusation, that he's a pan-Ethiopianist and that what he wants is a melting pot basically using the Amhara identity but, but uh, uh, adding the addendum of the Oromo identity and creating a kind of new, a new Ethiopian identity where everyone speaks Amharic and Oromiña. So that there are different perspectives that kind of people present. And I, I would say that they exist in this environment because he is incredibly uh, talented. Nobody could deny his intelligence, right? He speaks to Gringa, Oromiña, Amharic, quotes from the Quran in Arabic, uh, knows the holidays of the Muslim community, the Ethiopian Orthodox community extremely well, speaks to them in a, in a faith-based context. I just uh, watched a video earlier today of him talking to two leading Muslim leaders who weren't getting along. He got them to say that he was their child. And then he said, if, you're, uh, if, if I'm your child, for my sake, not for your own sakes, why don't you guys stop beefing? And just for my sake, at least spend 10 days together having a discussion. And, you know, he, he's very intelligent in that way. And he, he holds his cards to his chest. So I think nobody ultimately besides him and God knows what he, he is up to. But that has brought us to a situation where regional governments have uh, killed Ethiopian Orthodox Christians because of a dispute where the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the entire Oriental Orthodox Communion, including Egypt, Syria, Armenia, Eritrea, and India, have excommunicated three people that were former bishops because they uh, unlawfully, according to the church, not according to Ethiopian law, but according to the church, unlawfully appointed some 26 uh, monks into bishops, one of which who has repented, and several of which have uh, very shady backgrounds, including one of them being a Protestant minister and his own church released his salary that they've been paying him 250,000 bit a month and the receipts of that as well. So that's kind of my introduction and I hope you found your thread to give your perspective. Yeah, okay, so I mean, my, um... My effort in terms of the thread or the, the purpose of this thread was to attempt to try to summarize the situation and potentially help encourage people to understand that there is an exit path here, but, it, but well, to help and to help Dr. Abi ex to understand that as well. Because, um, I mean, I think we don't know what, I mean, those <laughs> that list of possible theories about conspiracy theories, if you like, about what what Arby might might be up to. Um, the other possibility, which is the one that I that I settled on um, for this thread, is that 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 he walked into a trap, that he walked basically walked into a, a situation that he didn't understand. Um, and then he said some stupid things and dug himself deeper into a hole um, would be one way of describing it. So 
this is what it says. So Abiy Ahmed Ali's dilemma, a revised opinion on the on the on the crisis. Um, and that's revised because the previous day I'd said various things which I probably shouldn't have said. Um, <laughs> so the first You're thing is <laughs> so politics is the art of the possible. I mean, and this is this is true. I mean, it is always you can there's always only some things you can do. There's lots of things you might want to do, there's might lots of things that you that, that would be good to do, some things, there's lots of things that have to be done, like solving the climate, climate and stuff like that. But I mean, sometimes it's not possible. Um, and so that's a thread about about the situation that Abi has found himself in in conflict with the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahido. How do you pronounce this? Tawahedo. I hate that they use an E. If they use an E, they should use the, uh, it's a pet peeve of mine, the upside down E. I get rid of the E and just go uh, T-E-W-A-H-D-O. Or if I have to, I do an I. But even the I confuses people. It's Tawahedo. And it's a, oh. it's a Semitic word that Arabic speakers and Hebrew speakers understand as well. It means being made one. And it's about the Christology of Christ being fully human and fully divine. But uh, Tawahedo. Okay. Okay, well, I, I won't, I won't mangle it again. Um, so, with a call for the EOT, EOTC for a nationwide protest on the twelfth. So, this is, this is this coming Sunday, and three days of wearing black and and praying starting tomorrow. The situation's seriousness should not be underestimated. There are reports people are wearing black. So, this is from yesterday. Um, were already being harassed by police and in, in us. I mean, what I was told is that the people were being beaten up by police. Um, and from tomorrow, the number of people wearing black will likely skyrocket. Since then, the government has, has instructed that nobody that's working in the government should wear black. Um, if you think this looks like a brewing colour revolution, that's because what it, that is what it looks like. Um, Ethiopia's PM, fresh from a military victory over the TPLF, and what appears to be a successful peace process, now finds himself facing a challenge which could could potentially end his premiership. Effectively, he's he's in a forked position in chess terms. He's being forced to choose between his Romo allies and power base and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, not just in Ethiopia, but everywhere. And that's a reference to the fact that there's, there was protests everywhere on Sunday around the world, including New Zealand. Um, mm -hmm. How he found himself in this position is not completely clear, but the history of change in Islamic leadership last year so this is around August. Well, it started in August. I don't know when that when it was completed. Is one of the reasons that people suspect him of active involvement in these latest events involving the Ethiopian Church. So um, there was basically there was a change in the leadership at the top of the um, of the Islamic um, faith movement, and a a Wahhabi um, Oromo was was became became the leader of the Islamic faith in in, in Ethiopia. Um, <sighs> The trigger events outlined in this quoted thread posted yesterday, um, yeah, that doesn't really matter really, but, but basically there was, a, there was a lead up to this, um, which was longer than those those three three things. But I mean, those three things were the most recent things and they included the um, the appointment and the, the appointment of these bishops and then the placement of these bishops in Welliger, which is enormously provocative for, for, for Amhara in particular, but just an enormously provocative period really. Um, but it seems probable that the excommunications in the EOTC followed a period of internal discussion um, that's been brewing for some time. I would I would say at least late 2022, but maybe even earlier. I mean, maybe you can shed more light on that. Abi recently made a very ill-advised statement in relation to the situation in which he appeared to at least condone the actions of the Oromo splinter group, whose actions led to the excommunications. Um, and at the time I was writing this, I wasn't fully familiar with um, his recorded cabinet meeting where he basically sat down, televised him telling his cabinet what to do, um, and they all took notes, And um, which was, from a political perspective, a very strange thing to do, um, and <laughs> and to, to say the least, basically. Um, no. I would I would love to see a translation of of, of what, what he actually said in that, but um, we'll see. I have spoken to several well-informed observers, local and international, all Ethiopians, and they're mostly of a view that PM Abi did all of this deliberately. So, I mean, I was, I, I still am of the view that it's possible that he didn't do it deliberately, that this is not a deliberate attempt to try and take over the church or to split the church by him. It's not a plot to do so. And I think the fact that Daniel Kibrit 
um, who's who's a who's a church advisor or, or was a church advisor of the prime ministers, but he's he's now left. Um, tried to mediate is possibly an indication. It's one piece of one data point which might indicate that he wasn't attempting to do this deliberately. He was trying to get himself out of this. Yeah. Um, By the way, a lot of people pointed out that Daniel Kubrat was not wearing black yesterday or today. <laughs> um, yeah, so which, I mean, which, would, which would have been a direct defiance of the the government mandate that says you're not allowed to participate by wearing black. Yeah, yeah, but he wasn't wearing black, so I mean, so he, he was wasn't. Not. He wasn't. He wasn't defying. But I mean, maybe he wants to get back. I mean, into the. But who knows? I don't. I don't know whether he he resigned or was was kicked out. But I mean, he basically, as far as I understand it, he tried to tried to mediate and failed, and and that's when he left. Um, the most notable of this incident of this was a speech last year to Parliament. So okay, so no, this year. I myself am more willing to give Abi the benefit of the doubt, noting he has a history of making occasionally spectacular political mistakes, sometimes verbal, sometimes through decisions. I mean, and he's not unusual in that. Democracy is a messy business and politicians do make mistakes. But the stakes are much higher in a country which is at war and in a country where the, the danger of, of lethal violence breaking out at scale, especially in Oromia, is very very high um and the most notable incident of his mistakes was a speech last year so like it was about june last year and it was during the period when the tplf was sort of like i don't know coming and going from from um from agreeing to peace talks and also where there was massive there was huge amounts of people being killed in, in welliger in west welliger um and he said that trees could be planted on the graves of dead civilians um, in, in some remarks to Parliament. And I mean, that speech was also a little bit similar to this one that we've just recently seen in the terms of him basically just telling people what, what was what. He didn't really let them ask questions much. He then came back a bit later and let them ask questions and he answered the questions. But um, that particular speech was, was disastrous for him politically. Um, and then there's the then there's at the end of 2021 he 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 freed um Sebat Naga along with Joao Mohammed. I don't think people necessarily would have been that upset about Joao Mohammed, but 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 people were incredibly upset about um him freeing the TPLF godfather Sebat Naga because Sebat Naga is sort of widely viewed to be the the money man person behind the TPLF and he knows where all the money is and you yeah. set him free, you potentially set the money free. Um, and one of the most anti waldeba people, by the way, early on, very anti-religious, which is crazy because his culture and even his name are all orthodox. Yeah, well, I mean, that's possibly because he was involved in that Mele's plot to plot to take over the take over the monastery and and build a dam. Um, Anyway, but all, be this as it may, the current situation he finds himself is one that cannot be easily undone. So it's not that easy for him to get out of the situation that he's found himself in. I mean, he, it, he, and I mean, in the past, these other previous things, he sort of blustered through them. He didn't necessarily apologize. Um, he did, he did say something. Well, he did, he did respond. I don't think he ever said anything about the Sebat Naga thing, but he did, he did respond to the other thing. Um, and I mean, Abi is right that this that 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 at a at a at a at a legal level, the church has to sort this out. But the issue here is the removal of the security, and the removal of the security from churches, including the office of Abune Matthias, the, the Pope, Papa. Um, it looks like intimidation. It is intimidation. I mean, and this this I mean this this was. On the same day, I mean, the day that I posted this thread, but then the, the killings in Shishamani happened. And um, and I mean, that's even worse intimidation because we're talking about a place where where there is a historical a historical uprising and there's, there's, a, there's a historical atrocities have been committed there as well in the past. So, I mean, it looks as though it looks as though there are aroma separatist elements that are dangerous and intent on violence. Um, <clears throat> So what can he do? Um, and then I say, well, this is this is what the advice. And my advice is that he basically has to make a choice. He's stuck. He can't he can't keep the church, and he can't and and the and the Oromo separatists. He has to choose between them. Like if he if if he if he really thinks the Oromo separatists are worth it, then he could choose. But I mean, I think that would result in 
in, in complete chaos and maybe the disintegration of, of, of his government. Um, between prioritizing the political base in Oromia, because he has an important political base from Oromia, um, for people who, who are not familiar with, with the polit politics here, I mean, he came to power as the regional leader of Oromia because the constitution basically says that one of the regional um, regional presidents has, is the only people that can be chosen to, to become the prime minister. Um, and he was number two at first. He switched with uh, Lamba Magarsa so that they yeah. could do that. Yeah. Um, and why does he have to choose the church? Because if he doesn't, if he does not choose the church, he wishes, he risks an expanding crisis and process similar to those that brought Morsi to power in Tahir Square. Now, that was something that people specifically raised with me when I was talking to them about it. That, mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, um, that, that, it, and, and, and a lot of people have pointed out on Twitter and elsewhere, um, that, I mean, leaders of ethiopia who have found themselves on the wrong side of the church have usually lost always lost actually is, is what is what i'm told but maybe there's a historical question with it where that's not true but it sounds like they've always lost so yeah. i mean it's just it's just he's on a he's on a hiding to nothing as we would say um and so and with that in mind he basically has no choice but to go and see the papa try to make peace with him and restore security to the churches immediately and i mean maybe i mean I, I said this negotiate an agreed statement it would be good if there was an agreed statement between the prime minister and and abuna matthias um whether that's possible or not i don't know but it, if if at least he does he shows contrition reinstates the security then then the threat is gone um to some extent um he in the past i think he there was a there was an attempt to try and get to get the Pope to come and visit him. They, their offices are quite near to each other in Addis, I understand. Um, but the Pope said, the Pope said no. Um, I mean that, I mean that, but I mean, I think that's a relatively simple way to end this crisis. And he's, and if he's, there's a theory that he's currently, well, I don't know if it's a theory. He went, he went to Italy um, yesterday mm -hmm. and he, today he seems to be in Malta, which I think he's on his way back. Um, so he'll be here tomorrow. So I mean, he still has he still has another day whilst this fasting is underway to potentially to potentially make this move. Um, and then I mean, the the end of it just basically talks about me make me changing my mind because I I got got it wrong in the first place, and um, and then concluding that I that that in my own personal opinion, notwithstanding a lot of people telling me the opposite, I I. I do give him the benefit of the doubt until it's proven that that he actually had a plot to try and break up the EOTC. Because I mean, I can't see why he would want to do that. I can't see him thinking that he would be able to get away with it and achieve it. And I also don't see why he would create a trap for himself, essentially, um, yeah. which is what I said in the thread. But I mean, that's 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 the that's the thread. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. My I. I I think I told you I have had friends who, from the moment he was elected, said he was going to do this and expected that he was going to do this. And I didn't listen to those voices because I was hesitantly hopeful. And I was where you were even up until two or three weeks ago. And it was this current situation that took me over the fence and think uh, that this was his intention. I think it was a really interesting dilemma that you put up, these these two kind of polarities of Oromo secessionism on the one hand, and on the other hand, listening to the church, which should be stated is led, the patriarch is an ethnic Tigrayan placed by TPLF, whereas most of the adherents of the church are Amhara, but there are also a lot of Kurage and Oromo Christians. I'm in Los Angeles and there was a Oromo singer on both sides, he's a gospel singer, and he was uh, in tears on Facebook and leading the kind of LA version of the protests that were worldwide that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. In uh, New Zealand, by the way, there, there are a lot of Walkait uh, people, the current scribe of the, the Synod, Abuna Petros, or Archbishop Peter, he used to be in, um, in the New Zealand and Australia uh, area. And I, I recall him uh, telling me that, uh, what, what I'd like you to expand upon is this idea of a color revolution, because I think there are a lot of kind of fake color revolutions that are related to US foreign policy, just trying to commit regime change in places. But what seems to be 
the authentic color revolutions as I understand them was at after the fall of the or towards the fall of the Soviet Empire, um, people like Vaclav Havel and and others who kind of had peaceful uh, change of power. Is is that what you were talking about? Is a potential, or because it also it sounded like you're talking about that, but you were also afraid that there may be eruption of widespread violence. Well, some of the Kerala revolutions have also had violence. I mean, the, I mean the one, the one, the Maidan one um, in Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. which which had an American involvement in it. Um, there was a color revolution in Portugal, which was the Flower Revolution, um, which was which I think was genuinely peaceful um, and spontaneous. Um, to be honest, I'm actually suspicious of U.S. involvement in this. Mm -hmm. I I mean. OLA and these Oromo separatists have always been allied to the TPLF. The TPLF is a US proxy. Um, and we are also seeing a whole lot of extremely intimidatory US behavior in Somalia and Somali region. And um, the, the president of the Somali region at the moment is apparently facing a bit of an attack in the north of, of Somali region. Um, on him between, I mean, a clan crash, client clash, but I mean, it seems to be originating from the direction of Somaliland. Um, in December, the, um, <clears throat> I mean, after the peace agreement that um, was signed, the American Department of Defense passed an appropriation bill where they, the, the text of the bill pretty much says that they're going to annex Somaliland and turn it into a port and they're going to create some kind of trading relationship between Somaliland and Taiwan, which is going to put pressure on the Chinese. It seems like some kind of, I don't know, fever dream of imperialist fuckwits in, in Washington, D.C. Sorry for the language. Um, oh, please. And, it's the right language. <laughs> and, um, and, and I mean, and, and, there's, and there's more to it. There's this Operation Justified Accord, well, Operation Justified Accord, which is a very large multinational um, multinational US exercise being initiated by AFRICOM, which involves um, Kenya and Rwanda and Uganda and um, Somalia and Djibouti. Um, and there is also um, ATMOS, which is the peacekeeping um, outlet and or well, the peacekeeping operation in Somalia is due to come to an end next year. It's been extended, but it's now seems to be confirmed that it is coming to an end. And Somalia has announced that it's going to send um, a, a second set of of, of um, soldiers to be trained in Eritrea, but it's also going to send soldiers to be trained in both Uganda and Egypt. And there is fairly strong evidence that both Uganda and Egypt were involved in proxy activities in the Oromia Southwest Ethiopian region during the war, um, and not just by arms um, supplying to OLA, but but potentially of 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 a, of a greater scale. So, um, I mean, all of which are reasons for that Ali that Abi Ahmed Ali might have also been distracted during this period as well. And frankly. My conclusion is that the activities which we're seeing in Somalia um, indicate that the US policy in relation to containment of Ethiopia has not changed, notwithstanding Abiy's visit to Washington DC, where he was seen watching the soccer with, with Biden and had, had lots of meetings and was showered with the, quite a lot of largesse and support. It seems that at the same time, the stuff was already already underway. So Operation Justified Accord was being planned um, in October. So before the before the meeting in in in, um, in DC. So I mean, not 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 long, long before, but I mean, I just think American policy doesn't tend to change. And the strategic reasons for them to want a weak, um, a weak Horn of Africa relate to the Horn of Africa's being on the on the trade routes through the through the Suez Canal and down the and down the South African coast. Um, but they also relate to there potentially being an extremely, enormously powerful um, 
economic power appearing in East Africa, immediately adjacent to the Middle East, which is obviously full mm -hmm. of money, full of money. So, I mean, it potentially it's the, it's the potential creation of a of something which could be another very significant economic superpower, which would have an impact of over all of Africa. I mean, Ethiopia yeah. is 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 culturally very important for all of Africa. Home um, of the Af African Union and friendly yeah. with Russia and China. Yeah, and Mandela, Mandela um, was 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 in in Ethiopia before before he went back to South Africa. I mean, there's the history of Ethiopia's. Um, yeah, I mean, Ethiopia is a is a is a country of enormous significance in international relation terms. It's the reason that the League of Nations fell over, and I mean, and this latest war, which um, should be called what it is. This is a proxy war against Ethiopia by the United mm -hmm. States. They lost their proxy, so they backed their proxy to try and retake it. And I suspect that's a bipartisan supported activity. And, and I mean, I don't know, the Americans need to back off and the Europeans need Amen. to demand, demand that they back off because the destabilization of the Horn of Africa is a security concern to the Middle East and Europe. And they've already started one more in Europe. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that analysis. And especially this term strategic is a tremendous word. When, when you said it, it my blood boils because I think of so many articles that I've come across from those conventional organizations that I had seen. And in fact, I'd say one of the things that has become clear to me over the past two, three years, you may feel free to disagree, is I've come to trust the independent investigative work of individuals over organizations. There seems to be a certain hive mentality or something where I don't know if it's seeking after prestige or, or power or what it is, but when they become large organizations, they, they kind of uh, are, are unable to, to see and sift through, um, like, like you said, the, the kind of continuous machinations of the global American empire and its, its ventures. The, the Suez Canal bit, I always uh, remind people when that kind of cargo ship got stuck and uh, the, all, that, all that stuff was happening, that's the economic power. And then the military base power of that area, they used to have a drone base in Arba, mentioned southern Ethiopia, from which they would fight al-Shabaab in Somalia, um, obviously help their allies, the Saudis, in this continuous horrible war against Yemen and have access to Asia and so many other things that you've mentioned. I honestly don't know what's going to happen and predictions are, are, are very terrible. I hope, you know, he repents during this three day time of fasting and prayer. Um, he's a Protestant preacher of sorts. I hope he repents and I hope he does come out with a joint statement with the patriarch, like you said. It would be inter-ethnic and it would put whatever ethnic issues uh, pre existed in the past and move forward, one Ethiopia, peaceful Ethiopia, that violence doesn't erupt. I hope all of these things. I don't think it's likely at this moment and I'm afraid for what happens next, but I'm wondering if you've said your hope, uh, do you have a kind of way that you think it will unfold, uh, whether it aligns with your hope or not? I think it might take. Um, I think it might it might unfold in the way that we want it to happen, but it might take longer. I mean, I think I think Abi's very stubborn. He's he's very unlikely to back down by Sunday. Um, it would be good if he did. I think everyone would be happy, and it could be that could be a celebration for everybody. Um, but I don't think the church is going to is going to push him to the brink fast. I mean, the the, the church seems to have been behaving extremely wisely and carefully in this notwithstanding 37 people being killed or 35 people being killed um yesterday which is which is pretty pretty big i mean that's that's an indication of how dangerous this can be um there but i mean if we have a couple of weeks of peace and um and maybe there's some back hit back 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 channel discussions between the church and and rb and he realizes that he can in fact back down um maybe yeah, that's right. can, i mean they might they the church might even be willing to let him let him escape without some degree of of of, of too much humiliation or whatever as well um i mean 
either way it's it's a ridiculous thing to be happening the whole thing is insane it's 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 foolish in in the extreme and it it threatens to destroy two and a half years of sacrifice and i mean yeah the the, the deaths of of, of um, probably a million people yeah. which has led, led to this point i mean if 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 abby's government falls um or or there is a or there is a return to sort of large scale violence in Oromia, then it all will have been for nothing. And and the enemies of Ethiopia will have achieved exactly what they've always wanted. Yeah. They would point to it as just another situation of Africans killing each other and ethnic strife and the sort of kind of uh the poor simple caricature that they always try to uh, mm. paint us with that broad brush i i'm with you there and i think in a lot of your analysis one of the things that has aided you has been your faith background i find a lot of people in uh, journalism you can tell me otherwise but at least from appearances do not seem to be of uh you know or, or let me say are more explicitly secular and um I think it kind of has a, a kind of internal or inherent antagonism to trying to empathize and understand these sort of uh, these issues. And I've heard people kind of just nonchalantly telling the church to bend its will to the prime minister. And it's usually, I think, the secular people who have been saying that. I wonder if you could share anything about your your faith background and if um, if that impacted the kind of lens through which you saw Ethiopia when you're traveling through. I mean, you're speaking with monks, you know, the fact that you even know what a monk is in a monastery. I, you know, I, me I meet adults who don't even know these words. Like you have the vocabulary, you know, to, to even begin. You know, I think, was it a famous uh, Hillary Clinton uh, blunder where she called uh, Christians in a, in, I was it, was it, in, it may have been in New Zealand somewhere. She called them Easter worshipers or something like that and uh it was a very funny uh it was a very funny odd description uh not even close to neutral right that's strange um <laughs> i have knew that um yeah so i mean my background is um i mean my family's my my great my maternal grandmother was a catholic um but my family's my immediate families weren't particularly religious my parents were not particularly religious um my mother i think was a sort of a presbyterian by by um by birth mm -hmm. and um i grew up i i joined a, a choir so i got a scholarship to go to a, to, a, to a private school by being a member of the cathedral choir in christchurch when i was nine and my brothers joined me in the choir as well and and um we basically it was we were basically indentured singers um, which <laughs> meant that we got a we got a great musical education as well as um as well as an education and um we sung about i don't know about eight or nine hours a week maybe 10 it was quite a lot um and <laughs> yeah and then after that i um i well i mean in my 20s i i sort of i died uh, my teenagers i wasn't wasn't particularly involved in, in church things but then then i um yeah then then i went to university and um and 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 into work and then basically returned to the church um in the 90s and in that case in that case it was still the anglican church which is sort of like that's sort of like the protestant um catholics really of great britain mm -hmm. and um yeah and then and then converted to catholicism and 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 since then i've become increasingly um observant i suppose and i mean i it's a core part of of who i am it's my own belief and going to ethiopia i mean I, it was i loved it when i first arrived and when i first arrived in Addis Ababa, there was all this singing going on yes contin continuous singing and i called it the singing city and yes and there was a mixture of islamic prayer and and the and the the all-night services of the of the of the Ethiopian um, Orthodox Church, and and it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. I mean, and I remember. I think one of the last, my last nights in my on my recent trip to Alamata. Um, where was I staying? 
yeah, no, we were staying in a different a different hotel in Alamata. Um, and you could hear that there was two churches and they were singing in counterpoint to each other. One church would sing and then the other church would sing. <laughs> and I mean, and it was it's 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 stunningly beautiful. I think it was a Saturday night. So I mean, it was a sort of like the 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 night the night for the singing all night long. Um, and also meeting Ethiopians. I mean, driving up through Wallow, seeing the the young children all all mixed together. I mean, some of them wearing the, the young women wearing hijabs and 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 um, with with children that were clearly Christian and and um, and I think my driver in Addis. I mean, he he told me he was he was actually Somali, Somali a Muslim, but he married his wife who was an Orthodox Christian, and he converted to Christianity wow. as a result. Um, and I mean that that he's far from unusual. I mean, it's completely, mm -hmm. it's just completely normal in in um, in Ethiopia for that to happen. Yeah, and one of my uh, good friends from Addis Ababa, JP. Shout out to him. He's got a Amharic tech show. He's uh, born in South Africa, and he moved. Uh, he's South African, Afrikaner, and he moved to Ethiopia at age six. Been there ever since. He's just about a year older than me, and uh, he converted to Islam at one point. But then uh, I poked fun at him because he has an Orthodox Christian Ethiopian <laughs> a wife and now uh, kids. So it's uh, it's a very interesting uh, blend of situation. You know, I'm always looking for a unique angle in my conversations and feel free to uh, decline. I will not be offended in any shape, way or form, but I'd like to give you an opportunity since you're such a musical person. If you have any songs that you remember, whether from the past or the, or the present, if not, I would not be offended. Uh, what well, I could, I could sing a song, but, um, okay. This is, this is a song from Advent. So like the lead up to Christmas, um, on Advent Sunday. Adam lay a pounden, pounden in a bond. Four thousand winter, thought he not too long. And all was for an apple, an apple that he took. As clerk as finden, written in their book. Nay had the apple taken been, the apple taken been. Nay had never a lady, a be never any queen. Blessed be the time that apple taken was. Therefore we must sing and de o gracias. De o gracias. Thank you. In our tradition, we have a couple of things we say. One thing we say after someone sings is, may God have you hear the melodies of the angels so that you can continue singing like that. Another thing, there's a statement in Amharic, you know, you have to just shoot your shot in English. But in Amharic, we say that if you never ask, then you might prevent yourself from receiving a title of gate commander or some, some aristocratic title or another. So thank you uh, for, for that. I mean, one of the things about that song is it's about Eden, and I mean, mm -hmm. Eden is Ethiopia. <laughs> that's amazing. I mean, it is, I mean that that that, and I think people. I, mean, I think that's another reason why Ethiopia is so important, and maybe it's also the reason why why people are so so wary and so fearful of it, because they realize it's the mother, it's the it's the mother of all of humanity. I mean, it's a very, very important place, and um, I just, yeah, I mean the, I mean one, I just, I was, there was another thing that you are, you were talking about earlier. You, you're wondering why is it that um, large institutions tend to um, not be able to express clear points of view? It's because of the funding streams. Large mm -hmm. institutions have more money, and they're more reliant on government money, funds. That's why they, that's why they can't have independent voices. Small institutions are philanthropically funded, maybe, maybe, maybe subscriptions, etc. But they, but they're not as vulnerable. 
Whereas you, whereas you talk, look at something like the Atlantic Council and so forth, and then it's, it's very difficult for it. It's entirely dependent on the State Department. That's fabulous. It, it, it uh, meshes really well with the advice. I don't know if you ever listened to, but as a 90s kid, I grew up listening to the Wu-Tang Clan. And on Chappelle's show, they told people that you have to diversify your bonds, by which they mean you need to diversify the sources of your income or your funding. So it's exactly that point that when you're able to diversify your sources of income, you have a, let you're less beholden to the voices of power and you could kind of speak truth to, to power more frequently. So thank you for that. And thank you for everything that you've been doing on, on behalf of Ethiopia. In conclusion, I, I do still think it's difficult for people in the English language, like you were talking about that speech. I watched that speech in Amharic. Uh, I didn't sit there and you know transcribe and translate it, but he basically, he kept using this phrase, which means he told everyone and he directly commanded his cabinet that nobody could take a stance on the excommunicated parties and on the church and that each person had to be neutral. But you know, the question a lot of Orthodox Christians had was, what does it mean to be neutral when there are governments fire having firing squads on orthodox christians um what, it, what does it mean to be neutral in that situation if there is a clear uh offender and victim or aggressor and aggressee what what does neutrality i mean it's an argument that people have had for uh, many different contexts, you know, many different times and places about neutrality, but I, I still think it's difficult for people to sift through the news for English speaking audiences only. So I would like my final question would be, do you have any advice for people on how to read the news uh, in Ethiopia and how to read the news in general? And then I wanted to, to give you the final word if you had any um, parting word and, and to plug Scoop again and, and wherever people could find you on social media as well. Um, before I do that, I mean, the, this issue about neutrality is where I got into trouble with this on the, the day before yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the reason for that was because, I mean, my initial, I was just looking at it, I didn't realize how serious it was. And I mean, my initial thought was just from a principle basis, from politics basis, the importance of the separation of church and state is a very, very fundamental principle of democracy. Um, and it's very important for, for kind of obvious reasons. I mean, what, what's happening in Ethiopia at the moment looks a lot like um, <laughs> looks a lot like Henry VIII versus versus the Church. I mean, I mean that's the that's mm. sort of the dynamic, um, which is which which was a which was a complete disaster and was a disaster for hundreds of years, um, and destroyed and destroyed and destroyed welfare institutions, which is including one of the things that the EOTC is as well. Um, but I think if there was any doubt about whether or not neutrality was, I mean, the the issue the issue it's not it's not neutral if you withdraw the security which you previously provide. And the church, I mean, clearly the state has an obligation to protect the church from from violence, especially from external violence. I mean, it has the responsibility to protect everybody from external violence. So. I mean, I think, I mean, what Abby was saying and telling his people was to try to stop them taking sides in the, in the argument. But at the point at which people were shot in Shishimini, then that, that argument disappears completely. Um, it's no longer a theoretical argument. The fact that he's withdrawn security from various other churches is also a, a concern, and potentially that is a, that is a form of, of um, of, of active, like withdrawing the security. And I mean, there was, I think there was a, it's also an inaction or failing to failing to put it back. So I mean, there's um. I mean, the the government is out of line at the moment. The security has to be reinstated, and it needs to be reinstated immediately, with or with or, with or without any kind of agreement about anything else from the church. There shouldn't be any preconditions about that. The the Pope is entitled to security. I mean, he's in danger. His office is in danger. His staff are in danger. I mean, we know that there are dangerous people in Ethiopia that 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 want to see a fall of the Abiy government, that also potentially want to see sectarian and 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 violence. I mean, and they're not all in Ethiopia. Some of these people are external. Um, and yeah, so that's that's that. Now, in terms of the news, um, 
the Financial Times is okay, and um, and the um, and the other one, what's the, yeah, no, the, the Financial Times is probably the only decent newspaper left, really, to be honest. Um, the Guardian, I mean, when it comes to reading the news about Ethiopia, the Financial Times is one of the only publications which has not been completely and utterly terrible about it. Um, and it's because they seem to be quite old school and they're well-funded and Japanese-owned. Um, I didn't know that. That's interesting. And, um, yeah, I mean, other than that, I would, I would suggest that people just be... They have to think about what it is that they're consuming. And if people are... If people are if they're consuming the same news media all the time, that's a bit of a problem because you you get stuck in a bit of a, a bit of a loop. Um, cable television, in particular, in the United States, is dreadful for that for that sort of dynamic. Um, it's kind of addictive. It's very very well designed for that for that pr precise purpose. Um, although it's failing spectacular for CNN because they seem to have lost all of their viewers. Yes, um, they they made the most money while Trump was in office counterintuitively yeah yeah they did um but <clears throat> local media i mean keeping track of local stuff i mean supporting independent media outlets i mean independent i mean one of the things people should understand about news media organizations is that they're all poor none of them have got any money um and so if there is some publications that they do like they should give their money to them um and not and not waste money on stuff which is which is not not good um and i mean buying buying a paywall subscription to the new york times for example i think is a complete waste of money for anyone i mean anyone anyone that is actually cares about ethiopia in the united states who has a new york times subscription should cancel it because those people are not even reporting on Ethiopia at all. Declan Walsh has hardly written a story about Ethiopia. I mean, he's sort of stopped. It's almost like they're boycotting, boycotting the story of Ethiopia because um, they feel other than to they, glorify the child soldiers of Tigray. Well, that's what they did in the past, but I mean, they've sort of. They, I think they've realised that they screwed up, and now they've just stopped covering it at all. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and, there's, and there's still a lot happening. I mean, and and there's a lot of stories that need to be told. Um, independent media like um like gray zone and yes um, i love and, that and i mean there's a whole bunch of of um i can't they don't immediately mint press news um black agenda report which which Anne Anne writes for i mean i think if if people have any discretionary income um that and they can give money to those to publications that they like then doing that actually really does make a difference because those publications they are entirely dependent on that support um yeah um my own publication we 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 would always be glad to accept donations there's a i think if you go to the publication you can find that there's a sort of a thing at the bottom of the stories where you can where you can sign up and join a thing called press patron and give us a few dollars a month which we would which we really i mean it's very valuable to us um that support um and that might help encourage my colleagues to think that what i'm doing is not a waste of time <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Give them the P O A A S uh, bump there by helping scoop out. No, I I appreciate that a lot. Your comment about the separation of church and state and uh, its inherency to democracy is fascinating to me as a student of political science because I think it's extremely true of the American Revolution, French Revolution onwards. But I'd I'd have to study it more. But I think the ancient democracies of Greece would have worshipped. I imagine the ancient. Uh, greek pantheon and of course uh, i think i may have to invite you on then to uh, analyze one day and it'll have to be its own issue uh, but the issue of israel which seems to be we we kind of uh, touched it when we were talking about the abraham accords but israel seems to be one of the major democracies uh, of the world which does not believe in a separation of of church and and state so um i i think maybe that would be a longer conversation but i I do thank you and, and appreciate you so much for highlighting all these things and and giving people, I hope, tools to um, to be able to read and, and, and sift through the news because obviously you've been able to do it. So it's possible and it's achievable and I think other people can. And I don't know how replicatable it is because I think it is a certain 
uh, personality that it takes. But um, I, I appreciate any tools that you're able to give my audience to to read about uh, the, the news in English. Well, Twitter is the other thing. Twitter is by far the most important news media on the planet now. And I mean, I think the idea that Elon Musk is going to free Twitter from the FBI and the CIA is is a complete pipe dream. I mean, it's now the most important intelligence channel <laughs> on the planet. No, yeah. so you're not and, fleeing to Mastodon anytime soon. I don't like. I, I don't think. I don't think Twitter is going to disappear, and and the other networks are just not big enough to 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 have the have the impact. Um, yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be on on the show, and um, yeah. Good luck. I I I look forward to watching more of your <laughs> more of your shows. Thank you.